Good evening, everybody. Turn to song number 263. Verily, verily. Song number 263 this evening. 263 on the first. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me. From condemnation he hath made me free. He that believeth on the Son, saith he, hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. He that believeth on the Son, tis true, hath everlasting life. All my iniquities on him were laid, all my indebtedness by him was paid. All who believe on him, the Lord hath said, hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. He that believeth on the Son, tis true everlasting life. Though poor and needy, I can trust my Lord. Though weak and sinful, I believe His word. Oh, glad message every child of God hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. On the sun, tis true, hath everlasting life. Song number 263 in the last. Though all unworthy, yet I will not doubt. For him that cometh, he will not cast out. He that believeth, though the good news shout, hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Verily, verily, message ever new. He that believeth on the Son, tis true, hath everlasting life. Let's open the word of prayer this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your house. We ask you to bless this entire service and music and also the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's time for favors tonight. If you have a song you'd like to sing, then raise your hand. If selected, we'll sing one line from it. And Brother Aiden, song number 11. Song number 11 in your hymnal. Song number 11, He Died For Me. Song number 11 on the first. I saw one hanging on a tree In agony and blood He fixed His languid eyes on me As near His cross I stood Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think He died for me. Let's see. Brother Joshua? 413? Song number 413 in your hymnal. Stand up for Jesus, song number 413. 413 on the first. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto And Christ is Lord indeed. Let's see, Brother Daniel? 415? 415 in your hymnal. Victory through grace, song number 415. <clears throat> 415 on the first. Conquering now and still to conquer, rideth the king in his 
Montel Senior. Song number 45. Song number 45. Song number 45 in the first. When I can read my title there to mansions in the skies, I'll be Why my weeping eyes and why my weeping eyes and why my weeping eyes all bid farewell to every fear and why my weeping eyes. Let's have Montel Jr. 356. I Must Tell Jesus, song number 356. <clears throat> song number 356 on the first. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Brother Darrell? Song number 206. Oh, say, but I'm glad, song number 206. Song number 206 on the first. There is a song in my heart today, something I never had. Jesus has taken my sins away, oh, say, but I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad, oh, say, but I'm glad. Cups overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. And Julia? Uh, 305. 305. Yield not to temptation, 305. <clears throat> 305 on the first. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus. Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. And can 
remember if I called Julie or Emily last, but... 408. 408. And this will be the last one of this portion of the music. 408, Loyalty to Christ. 408. Four hundred eight on the first. From over hill and plain, there comes the signal strain. Tis loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. This music rolls along, the hills take up the song of loyalty, loyalty, yes, loyalty to Christ. On to victory, on to victory. Cries our great commander on. We'll move at his command. We'll soon possess the land. Through loyalty, loyalty, yes, loyalty to Christ. All right, great singing this evening. Amen. All right, well, let's take our bulletins. We'll look at some announcements real quickly. If you do not have a bulletin this evening, just raise your hand and one of our ushers can get one for you. If you need a bulletin tonight, just put your hand up. We'll get one for you. The verse this week, Luke 14, 23 says, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. And that's a good verse there. We like that. If you open up the bulletin, we have our service time, Sunday morning service, 1030 a.m. And we, of course, have a time of fellowship on Sunday mornings from 10 a.m. to 1030 with coffee and donuts. Sunday evening service, 6 p.m. We're glad you made it back out for the evening service. And uh, we invite you to be with, be with us on Wednesday night for the Wednesday uh, evening Bible study, and we will be in Ezekiel chapter 7 this Wednesday, Lord willing. I should be preaching every uh, service from here on unless my wife goes into labor, so we're kind of on standby. She has a tendency to always, I think, the, I think we, we have five kids, and four out of the five kids, she's been in labor while I've been preaching, and uh, it's just kind of worked out that way. And uh, it's always earlier labor, so I can still come and preach. Uh, one of them, it was in our house. She was upstairs with the midwife, you know, in labor, and I was downstairs preaching the Wednesday night Bible study, and it was kind of crazy. For some reason, we had, it was like early in the, it was when we had church in the house, and we had like a big attendance that Wednesday night. We had like 30 people, and I was just preaching. And it's one of those sermons where you're just like, I don't even know what I was saying. I was just preaching. We just got through it and whatever. Uh, but so anyway, be praying for my wife. Maybe she'll go into labor on Wednesday, but I don't know. We'll see what happens. But uh, soul winning time, Saturday morning, church-wide soul winning, 10 a.m. Uh, additional soul winning times, Thursday at 2, Sunday at 2. If you're running late, you can call us at 916-868-9080 and let us know you are planning to be there, but you're running late. That way we can get a map and all of that. And just so you know, I'm planning on preaching. I mean, the only reason I would miss if she's like literally having the baby, you know, but even if I have to come in while the offering is being taken and preached, I'll do that. So you have my word on that. I'm not going to try to miss any more services. I feel like I've been missing a lot with traveling and things like that. Uh, praise report, Salvation for September 9. Salvation is here today, 482. Baptism is here today, 62. Uh, this morning, last week we had 177 in church. This morning we had 159. Last week we had 95 soul winners. Don't forget if you're a soul winner to fill out the communication card, uh, your salvation is on your communication card. And don't forget to return your maps in the bins, in the foyer, if you can help us with that. We, of course, are family integrated church. We have mother baby rooms, daddy rooms available for your convenience. If you have a child that's being distracting during the service, or if you need some privacy, we'd encourage you to head to those rooms as needed. If you look at the uh, announcements and upcoming events, uh, we, of course, have Family and Friend Day coming up this uh, weekend. And you should have in your bulletin three invitations for Family and Friend Day. And we just ask that you would give those out. This afternoon, before we came to church, we stopped by to get some coffee. And, you know, my, the kids were on it. They were like, give them a Family and Friend Day invitation. So we got a Family and Friend Day invitation, got a regular invitation, got a psychopath reprobate, and we handed it to the lady at the Starbucks. And she kind of looked like I've already got three of these type thing, you know? She kind of <laughs> looked at me like, and maybe, I was like, no, you look like a psychopath. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. But, uh, you know, just give them out, you know? And I'm sure the people down the street are getting lots of them. But make sure you help us with that. And uh, big soul winning push, Thursday, 2 p.m., Friday, 6 p.m., Saturday, 10 a.m., and uh, hopefully you're motivated to get the seed out of the barn. So if you can help us with that, don't forget on your communication card. It helps us to just kind of know how many people we're planning for, if you can mark, if you're planning to be there. Of course, you can show up 
without marking it. But if you would mark it, it would help us. We would appreciate that. Next week, we start two series, Sunday morning, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, and Sunday night, The Times of Elijah. So I hope you get excited about that. Basic electrical class for young men. They have a class this Tuesday, September 11th at 7 p.m. Don't forget about that. Philippines Missions Trip, uh, choir practice, ladies' weight loss meeting. They, had, uh, they have it every Wednesday, 6.15. Homeschool group, Spanish class, and PE class on the 13th. Field trip on the 16th. And don't forget to RSVP to my wife. Please don't forget to turn your cell phones off or place them on silent during the service so that they're not a distraction to anybody. If you look at the back of the bulletin, birthdays and anniversaries, uh, we uh, have Leah's birthday is today, September 9th, and Miss Michelle Cruz has a birthday tomorrow on the 10th. Maria Diaz has a birthday on the 12th. L. Ferreira has a birthday on the 12th, and Miss Kathy Maples has a birthday on the 15th this week. Quotable quotes, a quote this week says, a man who has found his true work, winning souls to Christ, and does it, such is the happiest man. That's a good quote. Free resource available in the foyer. Money matters. We'll get the offerings that have came in for the month of September. Uh, let's see. I think those are all, no, quick announcement. If you volunteer, and I apologize for this, this is a short notice, but if you volunteer to help with the grilling, if I could just meet with you just for like two minutes in the break room after the service, uh, well, like five minutes after the service, we'll meet in the break room uh, for two minutes. So if you came to me and you volunteered for grilling next week, I just need to talk to you for like two, three minutes after the service. So if you could please uh, help me with that, we would appreciate it. And I think that's it. So let's go ahead and take our songbooks and let's go to page number 396. 396, and we're going to sing So Little Time, 396. And let's make sure we have a great soul winning week this week. And let's just remember what we're all about, winning people to Christ and getting the gospel out. 396, so little time. We'll sing this out as we prepare to receive the offering tonight. Sing it out on the first. So little time, the harvest will be over. Being done, we reapers taken home. Report our work to Jesus, Lord of harvest. Smile and that he'll say, Well done. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us lots to win. Oh, then to say, Some dear ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some. 396, sing it out on the second. How many times I should have strongly pleaded. I feel too strictly worn. The Spirit moved. Oh, had I pled for Jesus. The greatest fallen lost ones not be born. Today we read. Or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us our souls to win. Oh, then to say from the burning, today we'll go to bring some sinner in. Despite the heat, the ceaseless toll, the hardship, the broken heart. Or those we cannot win Misunderstood Because we're all peculiar Still no regret We'll have but for our sin Today we reap Or miss our golden harvest Today is given us our souls to Some dear ones from the burning Today we'll go to bring some sinner in A day of pleasure or a feast of friendship A house or car or garments fair or fame Will all be trash when souls are brought to heaven how sad to face the slacker's blame. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us the souls to 
come, dear ones, from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinner. Sing it out on the last. The harvest white, while reapers few is wasting. And many souls will die and never know. The love of Christ, the joy of sins forgiven. Oh, let us weep and love and pray and go. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us lost souls to win. Save some dear ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinners in. Amen. Good singing. We'll have the guys come up and help us with the offering at this time. And let's go ahead and bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you asking that you'd bless the offering. Lord, we pray that you would meet with us tonight as we open up your word, as we study the Bible together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Bible to John 11, John chapter number 11. If you need a voucher, put your hand up, and I shall come by and bring you a Bible. John 11. If you need a voucher, keep your hand up, and I shall come by. John chapter number 11. We'll read, we'll read the entire chapter as our custom. John 11, beginning verse number 1. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he, do, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, Thomas called Didymus unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then when he, Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh to Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever that thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. 
Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth in be, and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had said so, and when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in the, that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her. When they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth into the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always, because be but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, and when he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. And then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him alone, thus if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation should perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth he took counsel together to, for, to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country to, near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was, was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as he stood in the temple, What think ye that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it, that they might take him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. Dear God, I thank you for your house and for your word of God. And I just ask that you be with our hearts, God. Just give us a tender heart to your word, God. And be with our pastor, God. Strengthen them and fill in your spirit, God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, well, we're there in John chapter number 11. I'd like you to keep your place there in John 11. And go with me to the book of Acts just real quickly. Just the next book over to the book of Acts. Keep your finger there in John because we're going to come right back to it. <clears throat> Acts chapter number 17. And tonight I am preaching a very doctrinal sermon. And the, the reason for the sermon, just to give you a little bit of, a, of context, there's this fake pastor in uh, New York who's trying to act like he's like us and like our movement or churches of like faith that we fellowship with. His name is Tyler Doka. And he's got a joke of an evangelist uh, named Justin LeBlanc. And these guys, I, I don't even think their church is a year old. I think it's like six months old or eight months old. And they've just came out with heresy after heresy uh, since their church started. And they just recently had this five-week series where it was just literally five weeks of heresy. And just back to back, there's a sermon called, Why Every Christian's Not a Saint, you know, like we're Catholic or something and why every Christian is not going to get raptured, and, you know, all of those sermons were bad, but one of the sermons, which in my opinion was the worst one, was a sermon entitled, Not Every Christian Escapes the Lake of Fire, and they're literally teaching that there are some Christians that are going to spend some time in hell 
during the millennial reign. Now, this is not new to these people. The first time I heard this uh, teaching, it actually came out of Kent Hovind. Uh, you know, out of all people, I heard about Kent Hovind teaching that some Christians were going to go to hell. I know there's a Baptist church, I think in Texas, that it's really just a cult, but they teach that Christians are going to go to hell. And now you've even got independent Baptists, even, you know, people who want to associate themselves as what we would call ourselves, the new IFB or whatever it might be, that want to teach that, you know, Christians are going to go to hell. So tonight I just want to uh, preach a sermon just refuting this. And I'm preaching a sermon entitled, Why Every Christian Escapes the Lake of Fire, and Why No Christian is Going to Ever Go to Hell If They're Saved. And the sermon is really exposing Tyler Doka and Justin LeBlanc. But I, I want to just begin with this idea and just kind of begin with the root cause. And we saw this verse this morning uh, with our soul winning uh, sermon, but uh, I want you to notice it again, Acts 17, if you look at verse number 21, Acts 17 and verse 21, and you know the Bible talks about marking and avoiding those who teach things contrary to the doctrine which we have heard and the things that we have believed. And when people creep in with new doctrine and try to influence uh, you know, believers, we as pastors need to stand up and rebuke that and refute it and teach from the Word of God why it's wrong and why what they're teaching is not right. But I want you to notice where this spirit comes from, where this this. The, this heresy comes from. I feel like it's really explained in Acts 17, 21, when Paul again was at Mars Hill, and he said this, for all the, the Bible says, for all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And look, when you hear this heresy coming out of these young preachers that are all a bunch of novice preachers. They're not, Tyler Doak is not even qualified to be a pastor, and we'll talk about that later. You know, when you hear this preaching, when you hear the flat earth, when you hear the oneness, when you hear the not all Christians being saints, not all Christians getting raptured, not all Christians, you know, uh, escaping hell, just realize that it comes from this young punk attitude of these young guys who are just spending their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And you know, it's bad enough that we've got Christians in our movement that don't spend enough time reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God. We've got people sitting in the pew who spend their time on YouTube and Facebook just looking for something new, looking for something entertaining. Instead of just having the character to read the Bible through once every year, twice every year, three times every year, over and over, reading and learning and studying. Look, it's bad enough when people in the pew are spending their time on YouTube and Facebook looking for some new thing. But it is a whole new evil when you've got so-called pastors and evangelists who are just doing the same thing. You think they came up with this? They found that on YouTube. They found it from heretics. They found it from Ken Hovind. And they just want, look, and here's what it comes down to. They don't want to put in the effort of actually starting a church, of actually knocking the doors, of actually reading the Bible, of actually studying the Word, of actually developing a following of people who listen to your preaching because you're actually teaching them the Word of God, because you're actually helping them, because you're actually giving them something. They want to just kind of cut that and just, you know, have a claim to fame with some new little doctrine, and they, all they do is they spend their time and nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And it's, it's always why it's these new young pastors, right? And they and say, look, just, why don't you just preach the Bible? Why don't you just help your people? You know, instead of spending 14 weeks on a flat earth series, why don't you just actually teach sermons that are going to help your people? But this is where it comes from. It comes from this attitude. And, you know, I want to warn you. Be careful about developing this attitude where every sermon just has to be some brand new doc. You know, the Bible says there's no new thing under the sun. And, you know, you say, oh, pastor, you know, you preached on soul winning uh, this morning. And we'll preach on soul winning again. It's good to hear the same things over and over. It's good to be reminded. It's good to, you know, hear the old paths. Amen. And just be careful about these guys. Oh, I've got something new to teach you. I've got something that no one else has came up with before. Be careful. You're probably going to teach heresy. But anyway, tonight what I want to do is I want to give you five points, five thoughts, 
Five ideas as to why a believer will not ever spend any time in hell. Because here's what these guys say. They say, if you're a good Christian, you know, you don't have to go to Lake Fire. But if you're a bad Christian, you know, you're still saved. You're not going to spend all of eternity in hell, but you're going to spend some time in hell. And it depends how bad of a Christian you were. And I want to just explain to you tonight why it's impossible for a believer to go to hell even temporarily. Now go back to John chapter number 11. And when you get to John, do me a favor, put a ribbon or a bookmark or something there because we're going to go back and forth between, from John a lot tonight and look at a lot of references from John chapter number 11. But let me give you five thoughts if you'd like to write these down. We're talking about why a believer will not go to hell. Point number one is this. If a believer goes to hell... If a believer goes to hell even temporarily, that means that the believer experienced death. If a believer goes to hell even temporarily, that would mean that that believer experienced death. Now the problem with that is that Jesus promised that those who believe on him for salvation would never experience death. Are you there in John chapter 11? Look at verse number 21. John chapter number 11 and verse number 21. The Bible says this, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. This is, of course, the famous story of Jesus resurrecting Lazarus from the grave. And Jesus is attending a funeral here. And he's talking to a woman who just had her brother, who she was very close to, die. And she's kind of blaming Jesus because he didn't show up in time to heal him. And she says, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Look at verse 22. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Now he says, look, your brother is going to rise again. Martha saith unto him, verse 24, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Because Martha believed in a rapture. And she says, yes, I know that one day he will resurrect. But I was hoping that he would uh, survive today. I was hoping that today you would have been able to heal him and for him to not have died. Notice verse 25, the response from Jesus. Jesus said unto her, and I love this. Because sometimes we don't understand, you know, he, she says, I know that one day in the resurrection, he will rise again. And sometimes we speak like that. Well, you know, because of salvation. And Jesus kind of corrects that. And he says, we're not talking about one day in the resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection. You know, we talk about salvation. No, it's not that we, Jesus is salvation. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Notice verse 26. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me, don't miss these words, shall never die. And then he says, believest thou this? You say, well, why would Jesus say that whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die? Keep, keep your place there in John. Go with me to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter number 1. You find all the T books. You've got them all clustered together. 1, 2 Thessalonians, 1, 2 Timothy, Titus, 2 Timothy chapter number 1. He says, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. See, the Bible teaches when you get saved, you will never experience death. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you take your last breath here on earth... They will say that your body died, but you didn't die. The last breath you take here on earth, you'll take the very next breath in heaven if you're saved. You go directly to be with God in heaven. And he says, look, Jesus said, whosoever uh, liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then he asks this question, believest thou this? And that's really the question of the ages. That's the question we ask every person when we're out soul winning. Do you believe this? Do you believe in Jesus? 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Notice what the Bible says. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Is it clear what we're talking about? He's talking about our Savior, Jesus Christ. He said, who hath saved us, who hath uh, called us with a holy calling. Notice what he says, verse 10. Who hath abolished death and hath brought life and, don't miss this, immortality to light through. How do you get it? How do you, how do you abolish death? And how do you get immortality? It's done through the gospel. When you receive the gospel, you, uh, the Bible says that death was abolished. 
O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? See, a believer will never experience that. You may die one day, and your body will die, and we'll say, oh, he died, but you never died. You're in heaven. And, it, and what's interesting is that God doesn't refer to the corpse of a believer as dead. The Bible often refers to it as simply being asleep. And you say, why? Because the idea there is that when someone sleeps, they're going to rise again. And you know, one day I will die, and they will put me in a casket, and they'll say he's dead. But you know what? That body's not dead. It's just asleep. And one day, it's going to wake up. And one day, it's going to get resurrected. But you know, the entire time, my soul will have been in heaven with God. I will, I will have never experienced that. You say, why is that? Because here's what you need to understand. And here's what a lot of Christians, sometimes new Christians, and there's nothing wrong with being a new Christian, but if you're a new Christian, maybe you shouldn't standing, be standing behind a pulpit and preaching doctrine like you know something. But what people don't understand, go to Revelation. Keep, do me a favor. Put your, keep your place there in 2 Timothy. So you should have your place in John and in 2 Timothy. We're going to come back and forth between those two, verse, uh, two uh, passages and go to Revelation chapter 20. Last book of the New Testament, Revelation chapter 20. Here's what you need to understand. Hell is death. Being in hell is being dead. We often think of death as a physical death. And yes, one day the body dies. But what the Bible refers to as death, is when someone is in hell. So when your body dies, but your soul goes to heaven, you never died, you went to heaven. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's what Jesus said. Your, soul, your body goes to sleep, your soul goes to heaven. But when someone dies and goes to hell, now they're dead. Are you there in uh, Revelation chapter 20? Look at verse number 11. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 11. The Bible says this, And I saw a great white throne. And what's funny about these guys is that they basically, they make the great white throne to believers, they make the great, and they make the judgment seat of Christ basically the great white throne as well. You know, it's like they no understanding of just the different judgments and what's going on. The Bible says, And I saw the great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw, I want you to notice the terminology here, and I saw the dead. I saw the dead. The people he saw, he referred to them as the dead. Small and great. You know, whether they were rich or poor, whether they were wealthy, uh, whether they were powerful uh, or, or not. He said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And, don't miss this, the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. Now, let me ask you something. If the dead are being judged, are any believers being judged when Jesus said, He that liveth and believeth me shall never die? Now, you've got to ask yourself this question. Am I going to believe the Lord Jesus Christ, or am I going to believe some clown named Justin LeBlanc? Am I going to believe some clown named Doka? I mean, Jesus said believers never die. And then we get to the, white, uh, the great white throne, and who's being judged? The dead. Look at verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead. Now, why does it say that the sea gave up the dead? Because here's what you need to understand, and I'm not, what I'm about to explain to you goes further than the scope of this sermon. I'll have to preach another sermon another time. But here's what you need to understand. Right now, there is a place called hell in the center of the earth. When unbelievers die, their soul goes to hell immediately. But their body does not go to hell. Their body gets buried, just like the bodies of believers. When believers die, their bodies get buried, their soul goes to heaven. At the great white throne, what happens is that the souls of unsaved people are brought out of hell, and their bodies are resurrected, and they are united, and they are judged. And then God takes the hell that is in the center of the earth and he throws it into the lake of fire, which is in the outer parts of it. It's in the outermost darkness. You need to understand that hell and lake of fire are basically the same thing, but they're two separate locations right now. There's hell in the center of the earth and then there's the lake of fire where people will spend eternity forever. At the great white throne, the souls of unbelievers are brought out of the hell in the center of the earth and their bodies are resurrected. They are united. And you say, what's the difference between the hell in the center of the earth and the lake of fire where unbelievers will spend eternity? The major difference is this, that in the lake of fire, they are thrown in body and soul. 
And look, both of these places throughout Scripture are referred to as hell because they're both the same thing. But the, the, the major difference is that the lake of fire, individuals will get thrown there with their body and their soul. In the same way that you and I at the resurrection will get a glorified body, they're going to get a body of damnation that will suffer in hell for all of eternity and never be consumed. That's what we're seeing here. So notice again, look at verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead, talking about their bodies, because honestly, probably most, you know, many of the corpses that have died throughout the earth have made it into the sea, which were in it, and notice what it says, and death, talking about the bodies, and hell, talking about the souls, delivered up the dead, which were in them. So death delivers up the bodies, hell delivers up the soul, and these people are called the dead, which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell, talking about their physical body and their soul, were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death. Now, why is it called the second death? Here's why. Because when someone dies physically and then they go to hell, that's the first death. They are dead. And when God resurrects them and unites their bodies and casts them again into the lake of fire, that's now the second death. And whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Here's what I want you to understand. Going to hell is what the Bible defines as death. So that's why Jesus said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, because a believer is never going to die if they never experience hell. Go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Now, Jesus went to hell, did he not? The Bible says he went to hell. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. His body didn't go to hell. His body was buried, but his soul went down to hell. Revelation 1, look at what the Bible says about Jesus. Look at what Jesus said about himself. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17. And when I saw him, this is of course John, when he saw the glorified Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, this is what Jesus said, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Notice what he says. I am he that liveth and was dead. Now why did Jesus say, I live, but I was dead? Why? Because he was dead when he went to hell for three days and three nights. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Notice how those two things are always brought together. Hell and death. Death and hell. Look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last. Notice what he says. Which was dead. Jesus talking about himself. Which was dead and is alive. Why is Jesus referred to as being dead? Because he was dead when he went to hell for three days and three nights. And here's what I want you to understand. When someone goes to hell, they are dead. That is death. It's not the physical dying is not death because believers die physically. But if they don't go to hell, they're not dead. Jesus said, they shall never die. So look, when someone tells you, if someone says, oh, no, 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 a believer is going to go to the lake of fire, just temporarily, just for a little time, if that were true, then that would mean that that believer experienced death. And that would make Jesus a liar. Because Jesus said, he, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So you've got to ask yourself this question. Who are you going to believe? A clown on YouTube or the Lord Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ said you'll never die. So how do we know that believers will never go to hell? How do we know that they'll never spend eternity in hell? They'll never spend a second in hell. How do we know that? Because if a believer goes to hell, even temporarily, that means that that believer experienced death. Number two, if a believer... Go back to the book of John, if you would. John chapter number three. And remember that we, I need to keep your place in, in 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy because we're going to come back towards that part of the Bible. Here's point number two. If a believer goes to hell even temporarily, not only would that mean that that believer experienced death, but that means that that believer did not have eternal life. You say, what's the big deal about teaching that a believer might go to hell? What's the big deal? Here's the big deal. Not only does it make Jesus a liar, but it's an attack on eternal security. John chapter 3, look at verse 36. Notice what the Bible says. He that believeth on the Son. Why don't you notice this word? Hath. You see that word hath? H-A-T-H? 
He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Now I want you to notice the word hath there, because the word hath, if you just look it up in a dictionary, go to, you know, some, just pull up a dictionary online and type in the word hath. Here's what the definition is of the word hath. Archaic third person singular, present of have. It's basically the old way of saying the word hath. Hath means have. When he says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, it means you have it, you possess it, uh, you, you are holding it. Here's what you need to understand. The Bible says that when you believe on Jesus Christ, at that moment you receive the sealing of the Holy Spirit and you receive everlasting life. Everlasting life is not something you're going to get later on. You have it, or you have it, the moment you believe. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Go to John chapter 5. You're there in John 3. Just flip a couple chapters over. John chapter 5, verse 24. John 5, 24. You say, Pastor, this is kind of basic. Yeah, so explain to me why I have to rebuke a pastor on this. Explain to me why I have to rebuke a so-called evangelist on this. You know, and the funny thing is that they're, they're like, oh, this is our evangelist. You know, and an evangelist in the Bible was someone who was a full-time soul winner. You know, you know or it was a missionary that was being paid. You know who's going to be an evangelist? Brother Stucky. You know, go to Manila and win souls full-time. You know, they've got their evangelist, and he, like, works a, a, a full-time job or something. And it's like, look at us. We're so, you know, we're doing so great. I even have an evangelist. It's like, well, I've got 70 of them. I mean, we got 70 people that go out soul winning. And they all work full-time jobs or, you know, don't get paid from the church. If that's what you call an evangelist, we've got like 70 of them. We've got 80 of them. You know, an evangelist in the Bible is a missionary who's actually getting paid. But would you expect them to understand that when they don't even understand that believers don't go to hell? John 5, 24, notice what it says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word. And by the way, remember, that's the seed. You need the word of God to get saved. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. Don't miss this have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. They have it. They possess it. They own it. So let me ask you this. What did the Bible define as hell? Death. See, the, 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 re, the reason that these two, you know, what's the opposite of hell? Heaven. What's the opposite of life? Death. If you go to hell, you're dead. If you go to heaven, you're alive. It's everlasting life. So let me ask you this. If God Promise me everlasting life. Life that will last forever. Life that will never end. And then he says, yeah, but you know, you weren't that great of a Christian. So just for a few years, you're going to die. You're going to go to hell. You know what that would make? That would make God a liar. In whom you also trusted, right? I mean, I mean, we're trusting in him for salvation. Is he just going to lie? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. Promise before the world began. So look, if a believer goes to hell, not only would that mean that they experience death, and that would make Jesus a liar, but if a believer goes to hell, even temporarily, that means they did not have eternal life because that life was interrupted and they died. Number three, go, go, look, you're there in John 5, 24. I said number one tonight. If a believer goes to hell, even temporarily, that means that the believers experience death. And I said number two, if a believer goes to hell, even temporarily, that means that they did not have eternal life. Here's point number three tonight. If a believer goes to hell, even temporarily, that means that that believer experienced the wrath of God. John 5, 24. We we're, just, we're just there. Look at it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. Look, if you've got a red letter edition Bible, these words are in red because this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you hear my word and you believe on him that sent me, not only do you have or have everlasting life, he says, along with that, you shall not come into condemnation. Now look, if you go to hell, aren't you condemned? He says, you'll never experience condemnation. Why? Because you're passed from death unto life. Go to, go to 1 Thessalonians. Keep your place there in John. Go to 1 Thessalonians. If you kept your place in 2 Timothy, you're just going to go backwards past 1 Timothy, past 2 Thessalonians, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. See, the Bible says when you get saved, you shall not come into condemnation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8 says this. 
1 Thessalonians 5.8. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate. I want you to notice these words. Putting on the breastplate of faith. Isn't that what saves us? Faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that shall be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. All right? Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for in helmet, the hope of, notice, salvation. See how these things go together? We're talking about somebody who's saved. They put on the breastplate of faith and they put on the hope of salvation. Now notice verse 9. Notice what the Bible says to those who have put on the breastplate of faith and have put on the hope of salvation. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to, don't miss this word, wrath. You know that according to the Bible, a believer will never experience the wrath of God? Amen. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Amen. If you're saved, you're not appointed to wrath. If you're saved, you're not going to come into condemnation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, whether you're awake during the rapture or whether your body is asleep in the grave, we should live together with Him. I mean, is it any more clear? Look, Christians are not appointed to wrath. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Go back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Now in John 5, 24, he says, and shall not come into condemnation. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, he says that we're not appointed unto wrath. I want you to remember that word, wrath. John 3, 36. We already saw John 3.36 earlier, but let's look at it again. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. Now look, he that believeth on the Son, that's someone who's saved, they have or hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son, someone that did not believe, they're not saved, shall not see life. Why will they not see life? Because they're going to die and go to hell, which is death. Notice what it says. Excuse me. But, but, notice this. The wrath of God abideth on him. The wrath of God abideth on who? It, on, by, it abides on those that believe not the Son. Look, unbelievers have the wrath of God abiding on them. There is a, a cell in hell with their name on it. And unbelievers are appointed unto wrath. And look, what is more, the culmination of God's wrath, you know what it's called? Hell. It's the lake of fire. So here's the problem. If a believer goes to hell, you know what they experience? The wrath of God. The Bible says that we are not appointed unto wrath. So, and you say, well, this isn't even that complicated. I know. But yet this is the joke of Christians. You say, well, why does it bother you? You know what bothers me? Because these people are trying to act like they're one of us. It bothers me because they're trying to act like, oh yeah, you know, I'm post-trip, pre-wrath, I believe the reprobate dog, I'm just like Pastor Anderson, I'm just like Pastor Jimenez, I'm just like Pastor Merrill, but then they come out with this stupid garbage, you know, just week after week after week of stupidity, and you, you listen to this stuff and you ask yourself, has, I mean, are these people even saved? Do they even understand what salvation is? And yes, it needs to be rebuked. Yes, someone needs to stand up and just make them look like the foolish children that they are. They need to sit down and shut up and get under an actual man of God that can teach them just some basic doctrine, like Christians aren't appointed unto wrath, like Christians will never die, like if you go to hell, you didn't have eternal life. Go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And, you know, here's what they're going to say. They're going to say that I'm going to go to hell for preaching this sermon. I mean, they're going to go to hell because they don't understand salvation. They need to get saved. 1 John chapter 3. If you start at the end of the New Testament, you start at the book of Revelation, you head back, you have Jude, 3rd, 2nd, and 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. I said number one tonight, if a believer goes to hell even temporarily, that means that the believer experienced death. If a believer goes to hell even temporarily, that means that they did not have eternal life. If a believer goes to hell even temporarily, that means that the believer experienced the wrath of God. Here's point number four. If a believer goes to hell even temporarily, that means they are being punished for sin. That means that they're being punished for sin. Hell is a punishment of sin. Now here's the problem with that. When you got saved, your sins were taken away. 1 John chapter 3, look at verse 5. 
1 John chapter 3 and verse 5. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5 says this, And ye know that he was manifested. Notice what it says. Talking about Jesus, that he was manifested. Why was he manifested? To take away our sins. Look, what is salvation? We've been saved from our sins. We've been saved from the consequence of sin. We've been saved from the wrath of God. He was manifested to take away, uh, to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Look at uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. And he is the propitiation. See that word there? That word means he is the appeasement. He is the satisfaction. It means that there was a debt that was owed and it was paid through Jesus. The debt that was owed, the wrath that was owed for salvation was paid through Jesus. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Anyone who wants to get, get, get saved can get saved. There's not any sin. Look, God can, 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 can take all of your sin if you're willing to call upon Him in faith for salvation. He is the propitiation. He is the appeasement. He is the satisfaction. He is the payment for our sins. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. You're there in 1 John. Just keep going backwards past 2 Peter into 1 Peter. <coughs> By the way, if you remember, this is why John the Baptist, remember John the Baptist when Jesus came down to be, uh, to, to be presented in, for his ministry? This is why 1 John, uh, excuse me, you go to 1 Peter. Let me read to you out of John 1 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. That's what the Savior came to do, to take away our sin. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says this. 1 Peter 2, 24. Who, notice what it says, his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. The Bible says that he, in his own self, he bare our sins. That's why the Bible says, for he who knew no sin, Jesus who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is why I say that these people are probably not saved. I don't think they understand the concept of salvation. See, at salvation, when you got saved, there was an exchange that was made. See, I was a sinner condemned to hell. Someone had to pay that sin. And Jesus comes along. You say, well, why did Jesus have to die to pay for my sins? And here's what Jesus said. I couldn't die for your sins. I couldn't go to God and say, God, I love my wife. I love my children. I will die and go to hell in their place so they don't have to. See, the problem with that is that I can't take their place because I have my own sins to pay for. They can't take my place because they have all, they're all their sins to pay for. What it took was the sinless Son of God who had no sins, and then He died, and He went to hell not to pay for His own sins because He had no sins. He died to take our sins. But it's more than that. Not only were our sins removed from us and placed on Jesus Christ, He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Not only were our sins removed and put on Him, but also His righteousness was removed and placed on us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Because, see, it's not enough to not have sin to get to heaven. You must have the righteousness of God. This is what salvation is. It's an exchange was made. He took my sin. I took his righteousness. Have you ever thought about why, did Je why didn't Jesus just show up as a 30-year-old and die? Why did he have to live, you know, that life? He lived that life because all those good things he did, all that righteousness that he did, that perfect life, when he was tempted in every point, yet as we, yet without sin, that whole life was placed upon us. Say, what does that mean? Here's what that means. When God looks down at me, he doesn't see my sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ. When God looks down at me, he doesn't see my good works. He doesn't see my bad works. He sees the righteousness of Christ. So you say, oh, well, you're going to die and go to hell because of your sins, even temporarily. Here's my question. What sins? They're gone. They, he took them. He paid, they've been paid for. You're trying to pay for a bill that's already been paid. He is the propitiation for our sins. He did it himself in his own body. He bare our sins. By his stripes, ye are healed. Go to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Open up your Bible just right in the center. You're more than likely found the book of Psalms. 
Psalm 103. Psalm 103, look at verse 12. Psalm 103 and verse 12 says this. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as, as far as, he's saying as far away as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions. Now what's our transgressions? That's our sin, right? Sin is the transgression of the law. So far he hath removed our transgressions from us. How far away did God remove the transgressions from us? He removed it as far as the east is from the west. Now, here's what I understand. Tyler Doka and Justin LeBlanc are flat earthers. So I'm about to lose I mean, I lost them a long time ago, but I'm really going to lose them now. But I want you to look at this spherical earth, all right? As far as the east is from the west. You know why God didn't say as far as the north is from the south? Here's why. Because if I start traveling you know, from the United States of America, and I start traveling south. Now, this doesn't work on a flat earth, but a flat earth is stupid, okay? If I start traveling south on a circular earth like the Bible teaches, you know that I will eventually go around, because it's a ball, right? That's what they say. I will go around, and eventually I will no longer be traveling south. I'll be traveling north. South eventually catches up to north. What if I start traveling north? Well, eventually I'll go around, And I'll be traveling south. I'll be in the south. The north eventually catches up to the south. But you know what the beautiful thing about east and west is that no matter which way, if I start traveling uh, west or if I start traveling east, east will never catch up to west. East will never... You'll never eventually get, you know, I traveled east enough and now I'm I'm in the west. No, there will always be an east. The east and the west will never catch up to each other. And this this is what the Bible says. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. You know what salvation, God, the, 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 what the Bible is teaching here is that God separated you from your sins so far. They will never catch up to you. He's forgotten them. He's put them in the, behind him. He's, he doesn't remember them anymore. That's what salvation is. But yet these people want to tell us, oh no, you're saved by believing in Jesus Christ, but he's going to take your sins and throw you into hell, maybe for five minutes, maybe for ten years, maybe for a thousand years. He's going to tell no, 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 you don't understand salvation because look, if I go to hell, if any believer goes to hell, that means they got punished for their sins. And, so, and at salvation, my sins were removed. Now look, we understand on this earth, we sin, and on this earth, God punishes us. On this earth, we be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap here on this earth. My son, despise not the chastened Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even every child whom he receiveth. On this earth, you've got a heavenly father who's going to give you a spiritual spanking when you sin. On this earth. But he's not going to send you to hell. Because your sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. So here's the thing. If a believer goes to hell, even temporarily, that means they're being punished for sin. The Bible says that our sins have been removed. And death and hell is a consequence of sin. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. You see how those things are opposite? Death, eternal life. Revelation 20, 14. You don't have to turn there. Go, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. While you turn there, let me read for you Revelation 20. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. See, the consequence for sin is hell which is death. Why do we go to to hell? Why do we die? Because of sin. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. But when you're saved, your sins have been removed from you, so you don't go to hell. So these guys say, oh no, believers are going to go to hell just temporarily. Why? Well, because they weren't good Christians. Because they had sin. What sins? When I got saved, all God sees is the righteousness of Christ on me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, here's what I want you to understand. The Bible teaches there are two judgments at, in the end, in what we would call the end times. One judgment happens before, I believe it happens, and some people disagree with this, and that's fine. I believe it happens before the millennial reign, and it's called the judgment seat of Christ. This is when believers are judged by Jesus Christ, not for their sins, We're going to see that here in a minute, but for their work, the things they did on earth. And this judgment will determine your rewards during the millennial reign of Christ. 
At the end of the millennial reign, there's the great white throne when the dead are judged. Now, according to Tyler Doka and his joke of, a, of an evangelist, you know, both of these judgments are basically for believers and they're both to just send you to hell. You know, I guess believers don't even get judged. You know, it's, it's, they're just both for believers. And here's what's funny. They go to this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and they explain that this passage means that people are going to go to hell. Let's look at it together. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's where it all begins. We, you get saved, and the foundation is laid through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now notice what it says in verse 12. Now if any man, now the any man here is the worker, right? This is the person that's going to get judged. And by the way, the Bible tells us in other places that when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, you stand alone. Every man will give an account for the things that were done in his body. So here's what they say. They say now, here's what the Bible says. Let me show you what the Bible says. Now, if any man, that's the worker, build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work. So it's not the worker. In verse 12, the any man was the worker. In verse 13, every man's work, that's the work. That's what they did. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the sh they shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. Now, here's where the mistake, where these novice make mistakes. They see this word fire and they just assume hell. Okay? You've got to be careful to just make assumptions. Just because you see the word fire, that must be hell. Hey, Einstein, the Bible says that God is a consuming fire. I mean, there's lots of references to fire. The Bible says the Holy Spirit's a fire. So just because you see the word fire is not referring to the, you know, uh, lake of fire. It's not referring to hell. So they'll look at this and they'll say, it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now look, what the Bible is teaching here is that God is going to take everything you do, the work you do, because you work all day long, you work all week long, and you do some things that have eternal value, you do some things that have no eternal value. You spend time out soul winning, that has eternal value. You spend out time in, in your garden, no offense, but no eternal value. God doesn't care. Now, it's good that you take care of your garden, but just realize it's wood, hay, and stubble. When you read the Bible, when you read the Bible to your children, when you pray, when you give out uh, uh, the gospel out, when you do things that have eternal value, that is the silver, uh, uh, the gold, silver, precious stones. When you, you know, plant a tree because it's Earth Day, that's wood, hay, and stubble. You know, when you teach Little League, wood, hay, and stubble. Nothing wrong with it, unless you're skipping soul winning to do it, you know, but nothing wrong with it, but it's not of eternal value. Here's what God says. He's going to take all of your work, and every man's work shall be made manifest, for that they shall declare, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is, what kind it is. Verse 14, if any man's work, not the worker, but the work, abide. So here's what he said. He's going to put all the work you've ever done into this fire, and, and God is a consuming fire. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. See, this is, this is to judge you based on your rewards. God's going to see how much eternal value work you've done, and he's going to reward you based on that work. Verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, because there are some people that get saved and they do nothing of eternal value. They might do a lot of good things and nice things, but they do nothing that means anything in the scope of eternity, God says, hey, that work is going to get burnt up. And he, now who's the he there? Who's the he? It's the worker, the one whose work is being tried. He shall suffer loss. Because if I got saved, if you, somebody knocked on my door and got me saved, but I never went to church, never got baptized, never read the Bible, never did anything, when I get to the judgment seat of Christ, God's going to put my works in the fire, and all of it's going to get burnt up. And that worker will suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Here's what clown evangelist LeBlanc teaches. He teaches in verse 15. Here's what he teaches. Every man's work, here's the example he said. He said, Pastor Doka, who's not a pastor, by the way, 
Doesn't even meet the qualifications. It says, Pastor Doka, you know, if he's got a church member named Jimmy, and he's investing in Jimmy and teaching Jimmy and building up Jimmy, then God's going to take Jimmy because he says Jimmy is Pastor Doka's work. And he's basically going to burn Jimmy up. And if, and, if, and if Jimmy was a bad Christian, he's going to go to hell and burn. And then all of a sudden, but he himself shall be saved. That's Jimmy all of a sudden. Now, I don't know where Jimmy came in in this whole thing. We've got the worker in the work. But somewhere in all that, the worker became a person. And here's what's stupid about that. Basically, here's what he's teaching. All of you are my work. So God's going to just put you all into this fire. And since a lot of you are useless, no, I'm just kidding. You're just going to get burnt up in hell. Here's the problem with that. You say, yeah, Pastor Jimenez is investing in you, but somebody invested in me. I had pastors. I had pastors that I didn't listen to, just like you got a pastor you don't listen to. I had, pa- you know, and somebody invested in that pastor, and somebody invested in that pastor. By that logic, we're all going to go to hell. I mean, everyone's going to just get burnt up and go to hell by that stupid logic. You're adding to the Bible. He's not going to take people you in. He's going to take the work you did. And he's going to judge you. He's going to pay you based on your work, based on what you did. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. But they turn this into the great white throne for believers. They turn the great white throne into the great white throne for believers. And, and, you, and you just shake your head and think to yourself, what is wrong with these people? Let me give you one more and we'll be done. Go to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. We're talking about why every believer will not experience hell. Because if they do, because if a believer goes to hell, even temporarily, it means they experience death. It means they did not have eternal life. It means they experienced the wrath of God. It means they were punished for their sin. And lastly, number five, it means this. It means that hell was temporary and not forever. Show me a verse in the Bible that says that hell is temporary for anybody. You can't find it. Revelation 14, verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Now look, Tyler Doka and, his, and Justin LeBlanc, they've already turned Catholic. They already decided that not every Christian's a saint. They're going to have, I guess they're going to have saints. I guess they're going to set up little candles with pictures of the people they think are the best Christians. You know, and start, you know, lighting them. It's funny because it's like, are you, you know, I want to ask him like, are, were you a Catholic? Because he teaches not every believer is a saint, which is a lie. And then he teaches, and some people are going to go to purgatory. It's like, you're just teaching Catholicism. You didn't come up with that. The Pope has been, you know, the false prophet popes have been preaching this for years. You didn't come up with this on your own. But the Bible says, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Go to Revelation chapter 20. Look at verse 10. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, the Bible says this, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet, I want you to notice this word, are. Present tense. Now, I don't have time to develop this, but if you study scripture, the beast and the false prophet are thrown. They're the first people that are thrown, body and soul, into the lake of fire. They're thrown into the lake of fire before the millennial reign begins. At the end of the millennial reign, a thousand plus years later, Satan is loose from hell. hell. Satan is in hell in the center of the earth. The, the beast and false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. The first people thrown into the lake of fire, body and soul. Satan is loose from hell, and he's allowed to wage war against God. That's the battle of Gog and Magog. Jesus basically whoops him, and now he's casting Satan into the lake of fire. Notice what it says. And the devil, Revelation 20, verse 10, that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the, feet, where the beast and the false prophet who were thrown in over a thousand years earlier are. They're still there. A thousand years later, present tense, they are there. Why? Because hell is forever and ever and shall be tormented day and night. And just in case you don't understand it, notice what it says, forever and ever. The Bible says that hell will last forever. Oh, well, believers are going to go to hell, but just, for te- just temporarily. Show me, show me that in the Bible. 
Well, it says they'll have their part. It doesn't say they'll be there for a part of it. It says they'll have their part, like that's their place. And these people say, oh, they'll be there temporarily. Then that means that hell wasn't forever. That would make God a liar. That made the word of God a lie. Go to Luke 16, where, where this last place we'll look at tonight. Luke 16. Not only does it mean that hell was temporary, it means that someone was able to go to hell and get out of hell. Once you go to hell, you don't get out of hell. You get out of hell for a short amount of time when God takes you out of hell just to formally... Hell is like the holding. And then he takes you out and then he formally judges you and sends you to lake of fire. You know, and, that, and, and, and that's it. Nobody gets out of hell. There's no, you know, the only get out of hell free card, you better, you know, take that. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ and you better do it before you die. As it, appoint, as it is appointed unto man, once to die, and after this, the judgment. So, you know, but here's what I understand. The Bible teaches that nobody, when you, get, when you go to hell, you don't get out. Nobody gets out. Let me prove it to you. Luke 16. Luke 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 16, verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell... The rich man, he lifted up his eyes. Notice what it says, being in torment. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. All right, now I'm not preaching on dispensationalism, but this is no, Lazarus' bosom is not a hotel in hell, okay? That's what dispensationalists teach. Bosom is a body part. You know, Lazarus is embracing Abraham. He's ever able to see them in heaven, paradise, verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Notice, for I am tormented in this flame. By the way, have you noticed that hell is a place of torment? Have you noticed that hell is a place of fire? Have you noticed that hell is a place where people are punished for their sins? This man is, is crying that someone just dipped their finger in water just to cool his tongue. Verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Notice verse 26. Verse 26 to me is one of the most interesting verses in all of Scripture. He said, And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix. I just want you to notice this. I want you to get this. Notice what he says. So that they which would pass from hence. I want you to, you see that word hence there? The word hence is an archaic word. We don't use it to, a lot today. But here's what it means. It means from here. Here's what, here's what Abraham said. There's, he said, beside all this, between us and you, he said, we're in heaven, you're in hell. Between us and you, there is a great goal fixed. So that they which would, he said, those who want to, those who desire to pass from here, from hence, from heaven, to you cannot. Isn't that interesting to you? You know that there's people in heaven that wish they could go down to hell to save their loved ones? See, I preached this morning on soul winning, and some of you said, Pastor, that motivated me. That's going to get me out soul winning. And some of you went, oh. oh, he's rattling his cage about soul winning again. He's always doing that. I'm not going to go. I don't really care. You know what? You may not be motivated to go soul winning right now, but you know when you'll be super motivated? When you can't do it anymore in heaven. When you stand there at the great white throne and watch the dead judge for their works and watch the loved ones that you had the opportunity now to give them the gospel. You had the opportunity today to give them the gospel. And when you, ca when you watch them cast into hell, and it becomes real that they're in torment. Here, Abraham is saying, there are, there are those, he said, so that they which would pass from hence to you. He says, there are people who want to go and cannot. And yet, you and I have the opportunity to go reach them right now. And we're too lazy, too apathetic too tired, too distracted, too backslidden. You may not want to go to soul winning now, but you'll want to go soul winning in heaven. But God says, too late. Once you're in heaven, you can't get out. And then he says this, neither can they pass to us. He says, those that are in hell, they can't come to us. 
that would come from thence. So he says there's people who want to come from hence, from here to there, from heaven to hell. And he says there's people that want to come from hell to here, from thence, from there, from there here. And you know, yeah, that ought to motivate you. I, you know, I, I want to I wanna get to heaven, and if I have to watch loved ones or people I knew die and go to hell, I want to have a clear conscience. I don't want blood on my hands. I want to be able to say, you know what? To the best of my ability, I spent my life trying to reach people with the gospel. I spent my life trying to get the seed out of the barn and try to make sure that people heard it. Because I don't want to have all sorts of regrets in heaven and say, I wish I could go now. Why don't you go right now? Why don't you go today? Why don't you just decide, I'm going to be there on Thursday. I'm going to be there on Friday. I'm going to be there on Saturday. I'm going to be, become a soul winner. I'm going to learn the verses. Why? Because in heaven, there's all sorts of people that wish they could do it now. But you have the opportunity. You and I have the opportunity. But here's, here's what I want you Here's why I showed you all that. It's to show you that once you're in hell, you can't get out. Once you're in heaven, you can't get out. It's final. It's done. Not according to Tyler Doka. You'll go to hell and just be there for a while. You'll be in heaven for a while. Go to hell for a while. Go back to heaven for a while. If believers go to hell even temporarily, that means that hell was temporary and not forever. So look, there, there's probably 20 other points we could make to this prove this false doctrine. Let me just review them real quickly. A believer who goes to hell even temporarily experienced death, did not have eternal life, experienced the wrath of God, was punished for their sin, and that means that hell was temporary. Now, let me give you some takeaways. Those are the five points. Let me give you three takeaways real quickly, and we'll be done. What can we learn from this episode of Tyler Doka and Justin LeBlanc? Well, here are three takeaways I want you to just consider. Number one, don't trust a pastor who does not meet pastoral qualifications. Amen. Don't trust a pastor who does not meet pastoral qualifications. This is just one more episode to show us why the qualifications are there. And you say, does it matter that he doesn't have, he has one kid? The Bible says children, okay? Every word of God is pure. God could have said child if he wanted to. He said children because he wanted to have multiple children. You say, well, why does it matter? Well, here's the thing. Everybody thinks, well, why does it matter? Till the guy that's not qualified teaches oneness. Till the guy that's not qualified teaches flat earth. Till the guy that's not qualified teaches believers go to hell. And believer, every, you know, till the guy that's not qualified called C.H. Spurgeon writes an entire heresy called dispensationalism. You say, it doesn't matter. Well, obviously, it seems like it matters. So when you see these guys who just want to bypass the Word of God, and look, maybe, maybe the qualifications of children are there just because it takes time to have children, and God wants you to mature a little bit. Maybe the qualifications are there because God does not want you to be a novice that is lifted up with pride, which is exactly what these guys are. So what can we learn from this? Here's what we should take away from it. Don't trust a pastor who doesn't meet the pastoral qualifications because it seems like all the guys that want to bypass. I mean, what I've learned from this is that it's extremely important who I lay my hands on. That's what the Bible says. Lay not your hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. It's extremely important who I lay my hands on because we need to be able to look at these men Look at their wives, look at their character, look at their doctrine, look at their lives, and make sure that they're actually who they say they are. So when you've got a guy who obviously doesn't meet the qualifications, and he's just going to go ahead and do it anyway, don't trust that guy. So here's, what we, here's the takeaways. Don't trust a pastor who does not meet the pastoral qualifications. Here's takeaway number two. Don't trust a flat earther. Don't trust a flat earther. I mean, you know, when, the, when Tyler Doga came out with Flat Earth, we're all like, whoa, we don't want anything to do with you. And everybody was like, you guys are so mean. You know, and look, I'll be honest with you, I try to have mercy on people. When he came out with the, that stupid Flat Earth thing, you know, I had somebody walked up to me after service and said, Tyler Doga preached Flat Earth. And this is what I, 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 I don't remember if it was Brother Oliver or who it was, somebody was telling me this. And literally this is what I was saying, and I was being stupid, all right? I'm, I'm confessing my faults to you. I said, you know, being a flat earther makes you an idiot. Being a flat earther makes you a moron. But, you know, maybe we should just try to be kind, or maybe we should just try to show some mercy. Maybe we can help him out and get him straightened out. And then, and then whoever it was was like, oh, he attacked you in the sermon because you've got to glow up. And I'm like, oh, wow, it's on now. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, man, you know, I'm trying to defend him a little bit. And he's like, yeah, you've got a flat earth. And he was mocking, you know, the pastors who've got a, who've got a glow. 
You know what we learned? Here's, what I, here's all I'm telling you. And this is anecdotal evidence, but here's what I've learned. Every flat earther is into, is into major heresies. It's not a coincidence. You say, well, is it that being a flat earther makes you go into heresy? I think what it is is this. If you're stupid enough to believe in a flat earth, you're stupid enough to believe just about anything. I mean, if you're, if you're a moron enough to watch videos on YouTube and they convince you that the earth is flat, you'll probably watch anything and believe it. So look, when someone tells you they're a flat earther, just don't trust them. Because that's probably the least of their problems. They're probably into all sorts of stupidities. So what are the takeaways? Number one, don't trust a pastor to not meet pastoral qualifications. Number two, don't trust a flat earther. Here's takeaway number three. Don't trust a man who's just a little too manicured. You say, what are you talking about? I've never really taken a look at Tyler Doka till this week. But I was sitting there watching his video, and I, I just thought to myself, this guy plucks his eyebrows. I mean, you know, it's just a little too trendy. No, guys don't have eye, you know, guys have eyebrows like this. I'm thinking to myself, this guy plucks his eyebrows. He's got his beard, but it's trimmed so that, like, it looks like a goatee, but there's enough hair. You know, it's just his little trendy T-shirt. Here's all I'm telling you. You know, here's all I'm telling you. When you look at a guy and he's just a little too metrosexual, I'm not saying he's a fag. I'm not saying he's a queer. But when they're just a little too into themselves, be careful. You say, how, you know, look, pastors should be ugly. <laughs> pastors should be angry. Pastors should be hairy. I can't grow a beard. I just make up for it with my eyebrows. You know, pa when a guy is just a little too into his looks, be wary. Be wary. Because maybe that shows you that there's some pride there. Maybe that shows you that there's a problem with pride. You know, these guys get up, and they're all skinny, and they've got their little flashy shirts on. It's like, good night. And then and they're teaching all this stupid garbage. And you say, you know, Pastor, you're being mean. You, these people need somebody to put them in their place. Because here's the thing. When they came out with the flat earther, you know what we said? We said, we want nothing to do with you because you're going to make us look stupid. And then weeks later... Not all Christians are saints. Not all Christians get raptured. Not all Christians escape. And it's like mission accomplished. You, make the, you made us look stupid. Exactly what we said you were going to do. We said you're going to make us look like an idiot. Now we all look like idiots. So you know what? Somebody needs to stand up and just rebuke it and say it's stupid. We don't believe it. That's not what the Bible says. And just a basic education in the Word of God would help you to understand that when you get saved, you get saved from hell. You don't go to hell. So yeah, we rebuke Tyler Doka. I rebuke Justin LeBlanc, or whatever his name is. And you know what? We need to just stand against these people. Because look, you know what? You know what Satan's trying to do? This oneness thing, this flat earth thing, this you know, saints thing, and Christians going to hell. He's trying to make churches like ours look stupid. And if we just stand back and do nothing and don't refute it and don't defend it, then everyone's just going to think, oh, that new IFB, they're all flat earthers. They are, they, that new IFB, they, they think Christians are going to go to hell. No, no, we don't. No, we don't. We believe the Bible. We believe the Word of God. We must always stand for the truth. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your Word. Thank you for the Bible. And Lord, I realize that a lot of the things that we are teaching today are just basic, basic things. But Lord, I pray that you would just help us to, to just be grounded in the word and to not be these Christians that are cast about with every wind of doctrine, to not be these Christians that are just constantly looking for some new thing, some new idea to push, something to just make us look smarter than the rest. Lord, help us to be content to just know and study the old paths, the doctrines that have been taught to us. And Lord, when these men stand up and they try to act like they're with us, and then they teach heresy, help us to realize that it is our job to rebuke them sharply. It is our job to show where they're wrong. And we don't hate individuals, but we have to stand for the truth. And Lord, I pray that you'd help these men, Lord, uh, to just back down and to back off and to just quit because they don't deserve to be in the positions they're in. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray.